here we've got our Arctarchy situation for the U.S., our Arctarchy situation for China, and in the middle we've got our import demand and export supply curves for the U.S. and China, respectively. So now we can see where that free trade equilibrium is. And so here we want to start in our world trade diagram. So this tells us our world trade volume, and it also tells us the world price. That world price we can bring over to the U.S., and notice the world price, as we knew it would be, is below the U.S.'s Arctarchy price. And because of that, the quantity demanded increased and the quantity supplied decreased. With the difference between the two being the U.S.'s imports of tires from China. So notice imports went from zero to something bigger because with a lower price, U.S. tire firms have less incentive to make tires and U.S. consumers want to buy more tires. We can also take this world price over to China and see what's happening there. Same world price in both places because we assume no transportation cost. So we know in China, the price of tires is rising, inducing Chinese producers to supply more to the market. But that higher price is also reducing Chinese domestic demand for tires. With, ex with uh, supply increasing and demand decreasing in China, China will export the difference. So if we had drawn these absolutely to scale, then the imports over in the United States would be exactly equal to the exports coming out of China. Right? That difference would have to be the same. It would also be the same here. These are the imports in the U.S. would equal the exports in China. Let's put a C in the U.S. there just to keep that cleaner. So all four of these figures or numbers or values would be the same regardless of which diagram we're looking at. This, by the way, is only true in a two-country model, but that works just fine for us. Okay, now we want to think about what were the welfare effects in both the U.S. and China from going from an Arctarchy situation to a free trade situation. So here, we know in the U.S. that the price fell. So let's think about what consumer surplus and producer surplus were before free trade and after free trade. So I'm going to label some areas. So A, B, C, D, and E. These are just various areas that uh, identify the triangles and other geometric shapes that we uh, have here in this diagram. And what we want to ask ourselves then is what was, so we can think about um, our Tarky. And what was consumer surplus in our Tarky? So in our Tarky, consumer surplus is just area C, above the price that was in the market, the Artarchy price, but below the demand curve. How about producer surplus? A and E? A and E. Again, the area above the supply curve but below the Artarchy price. So with free trade, notice that consumer surplus now goes to A plus B plus C plus D. And what happens to producer surplus? It's now only E. Okay. So now we can think about the net effect on consumers. So when we think about the net effect, we want to think about free trade minus the Artarchy situation. So we can see with free trade, consumer surplus goes up by A, B, and D. And producer surplus goes down by A. Okay. Notice, consumers are unambiguously better off. There has been an increase in consumer surplus because of the lower price of the product. Producers, domestic producers of the product, are unambiguously worse off. They're now receiving a lower price for their product. How about on net? What's the net net? So the net net effect is an increase of B plus D. So we could also say that on balance, the U.S. is better off. We've had an increase in economic welfare, even though there have been distribution of income effects. Consumers are clearly better off, and producers are clearly worse off. Now, notice that's exactly the same results that we came up with before in our general equilibrium analysis, that the country as a whole, by moving towards free trade, would move to a higher country indifference curve. But there would be distribution of income effects, depending upon whether factors of production were specific or mobile, whether factors of production were relatively abundant or relatively scarce. Well, let's do the same thing. Oh, you can fill that in. Uh, let's do the same thing for China real quickly. I'm going to use J, J, L, M, N, O. I'll start a little higher. So what happens, so what's the Artarchy consumer surplus? J, K, and M, thank you. 
And producer surplus? N and O. So again, remember, con producer consumer surplus under the demand curve above the price, producer surplus under the price above the supply curve. So now with free trade, our consumer surplus will now be just M. And producer surplus, we had N and O before, and now we get to add J, K, and L. So our net effect, so on consumer surplus, we have, remember, we're subtracting the free trade situation, uh, subtracting from the free trade situation, the Artarchy situation. So in here, our consumer surplus goes down by minus J minus K. Consumers are worse off, unambiguously. Producers gain J plus K plus L. So the net effect for China is plus L. What we saw here is just the opposite in China than what we see in the US. Consumers lose because free trade is raising the price of tires. Producers gain because free trade is raising the price of tires. But producers are gaining more than consumers are losing. So on balance, the country has a net increase in economic welfare. Again, just like what we saw with our general equilibrium models, um, the country is better off with free trade than in an autarchy situation. Okay, so let's think about tariffs now. Tariffs turn out to be, uh, historically, turn out to be one of the more um, popular types of trade barriers uh, that have been around. They're much less in vogue nowadays, or maybe they're coming back into vogue nowadays, but for years and years after World War II, they declined in, um, declined in importance for reasons we'll talk about a little later. A tariff is nothing more than a tax on imported goods. Now, some tariffs are specific, meaning a certain dollar amount per unit imported. Some are ad valorem taxes, which are basically sales taxes or percentage taxes, X percent of the value of the product. Some products actually are a mix of the two. There's a specific plus an ad valorem uh, tariff on them. If you go to the International Trade Commission, U.S. International Trade Commission's website, it's also, I think, at the Department of Commerce, and you, print, you can actually print off the uh, tariff schedule for the United States. Um, some night when you can't sleep, you know, read the first page or two, like a baby. Um, also, be careful printing it off. It's incredibly long. It's also incredibly complex and, I would say, incredibly stupid. But not that I think the tariffs necessarily are stupid, but the way we've got our setup in the U.S. is just a mess. Now, remember, we've got two cases that we need to consider, a small country case and a large country case. So let's start with a small country case because it's, it's really clean and we can get through it very quickly. One of the things we know about a tariff is that it puts a wedge between the prices in the U.S. and in the foreign country, China. Now, we're assuming here in this model that the U.S. in this particular case is a small country, right? This is the small country case, small country price effects. So you may think that the uh, uh, U.S. is a large country, but here we're assuming it's a small country. Okay? The tariff will raise the price in the United States by the full amount of the tariff. And it does so because it has no effect on the price in China, right? Small countries' trade policies cannot affect the world price. So no matter what the small country we're calling the U.S. does, the world price does not change. That, of course, makes it very easy to analyze because in terms of the price effects, we would see the price rise to P sub T. And that higher price would reduce the quantity demanded in the United States. It would reduce the quantity supplied. That should be a supply. The quantity supplied in the United States. And, of course, it would reduce the amount of imports in the United States. Which, of course, is exactly what it was intended to do. The tariff was put into place in order to reduce import competition. By raising the price of those imported goods, we reduce the volume of imports that are coming in, so the domestic manufacturers have less competition, and with a higher price, they will expand their uh, output. Now, the price increase that we have going on right here, so this is the full value of our specific tariff T. And this price is, refer is referred to as the tariff-ridden price. Okay. So a tariff-ridden price is nothing more than the price that you pay in the domestic market after the tariff has been imposed. Now, one thing to note. It's possible that we could have put on a big enough tariff to eliminate all imports if the tariff were big enough to raise the domestic price to or above the U.S.'s Artarchy price, imports would go to zero. Such a tariff is referred to as a prohibitive tariff. Okay? So when you hear prohibitive tariff, it doesn't mean the tariffs are prohibited. prohibited. It simply means that the tariff rate will prohibit imports from coming in. So a prohibitive tariff raises the tariff-ridden price to or above the Artarchy price. And that implies that imports will be zero. Yes? Yes. 
Well, it, um, yes, yes. If there were transportation costs, so the world price may or may not include transportation costs, but if it does not, then the actual price that we face is slightly higher than that, and the tariff would be put on top of that. Okay, so what we've seen then, and this is partly simply by assumption of being a small importing country, raises the price of the good by the full amount of the tariff and has no effect on the price in the exporting country. So in essence, what we mean, obviously, by a small country is almost a perfect competition uh, analog, right? A perfect competition, no matter how much a firm produces or doesn't produce, doesn't have any effect on the market price. So it's exactly what we're saying here. Regardless of how much this small country produces or doesn't produce, imports or doesn't import, will not have uh, any effect on the world price. Yes? Uh -huh. No. Because we would have a price well above what China's price is. Yeah, right. Exactly. So then the quantity, the domestic quantity supply would be greater than the domestic quantity demanded, and that would force the domestic price back down to the RTRP price. That's a good question. I like that. It should be on an exam somewhere. Okay, so now let's think about the welfare effects that take place in this small country. So again, let's identify some areas, A, B, C, D. So now we want to think about the change in consumer surplus. Now, what we're looking at here is only the changes, right? We know we don't have to figure out where we were to begin before the tariff and where we were after and do all the arithmetic. We know how to figure out what the changes are. So remember, in this case, the price of tires went up to a piece of T, not T for tires, but T for tariff. So the consumer surplus went down by A, by B, by C, by D. Right? The change in the price from PT to PW under the area of the uh, demand curve. Wow, consumers got hosed. And by the way, it's a technical economics term. I don't know what it means, but I'm sure it's a technical economics term in the appendix of your book. Okay, so what happens to producer surplus? So producers are better by, exactly, area A. Now think about what this means with a tariff in terms of what we've shown. The reason that we import is because the quantity demanded domestically is always greater than the quantity supplied. Right? So the demand curve, at whatever price that we're talking about below the Artarchy price, the demand curve is always going to be to the right of the supply curve. That's why we're importing. Quantity demand is greater than quantity supplied. So when you increase the price, consumers will always be hurt more than producers will benefit. We'll come back a little later to talk about, hmm, if that's true, then why would a government ever do that? We will talk about politics involved next week. Okay, anything else happen? Ah, the government gets taxes. So we've also got a government revenue effect. And what does the government get in tax revenues or tariff revenues? Area C, right? So that's the size of the tariff times the reduced volume of imports that we have. So the government increases by area C in terms of revenue. Now, typically what we assume is that any revenue that the government receives will be redistributed to somebody in the country, in the country. It might go to producers, it might go to consumers. It might be redistributed in terms of tax cuts or tax rebates or those types of things. It may be redistributed by an increase in government spending to provide government services to whoever the beneficiaries are. Notice that that government revenue, if it's being redistributed, becomes a benefit to somebody. So the plus sign makes sense. So our net effect here, or the net change, is minus B minus D. So our loss areas are these two. Okay. So what do we call those two areas? We have a lot of names for them, by the way. But I'm sorry? They are deadweight losses. Anything else? Okay. These are also referred to as consumption distortions. So D is a consumption distortion, while B is a production distortion. Now, what we mean by a distortion here is a change in behavior from the free market price. So we're assuming that the free market price gives us the most efficient allocation of resources and consumption patterns. We'll talk about a situation next week where that might not be the case, but we'll leave that as a special case. So our basic hypothesis is free market solution gives us the right outcomes. A government policy to intervene in the marketplace, therefore, distorts the price and behavior by both consumers and by producers. So D and B are both consumption, or consumption distortions for D and production distortions for B. They are dead weight losses. They are also what we refer to as efficiency losses. Right? All three of those are exactly the same. The dead weight loss to society, the